I'm going to take uh, December to hopefully inspire you, uh, to give you a, a really strong foundation on the Bible itself. And uh, so I think it's going to be inspiring. It's, uh, it's definitely informational. And I'm praying it's going to launch us into the new year with a real passion for the Word of God. And uh, if I were to give you the three primary reasons why I'm doing this, number one is just to give you an appreciation for what you hold in your hand because this document is miraculous from beginning to end. And sometimes we fail to appreciate that. We just think, oh, it's a Bible. This isn't just a Bible. This is the Word of God. And it is miraculously delivered to us and miraculously preserved for us. The second reason is that I want to prepare our hearts for Christmas because we're now entering the Christmas season. Uh, how many of you put lights up or a tree or something so far? Anybody got anything up? Okay, we put our stuff up. Uh, it's just very Christmassy feeling. And uh, we're moving into that season. And I want to prepare your heart so that as we go into this season, we're actually moving in the right direction with the right heart for God. And uh, the message that I'm going to be teaching on Christmas Sunday uh, will be the Word became flesh. And so we're going to talk about the Word of God, and in particular on Christmas Sunday, how the Word became flesh and the significance of Jesus Christ coming. And the third reason that I want to uh, share this is because I want to encourage you to read through the Bible in 2013. I know so many Christians that have never read either the Old Testament or parts of the Old Testament, uh, and a lot of Christians that have never read the entire Bible. And, uh, and I want to encourage you this year to make that one of the goals that you, that you strive for. In fact, you know what I do? Um, because I, I uh, have learned over the years that when you set uh, goals and New Year's resolutions, most of them never come to pass. And uh, too much pressure is right at the beginning. So what I would encourage you to do is to start now. And then you're way ahead of the game. You've got a whole month to get a big flying leap on reading through the Bible. Uh, we're going to be suggesting some ways that you can do that in the weeks to come. Uh, but however you'd like to do that, I, I want to encourage you to do that and to become very familiar with the Bible and know the Bible better than ever before at the end of 2013. So let's get started. We're going to go to Psalm 19, and we're going to read uh, verses 7 through 11. If you can join me there in Psalm 19. This is an awesome psalm about the revelation of God. Verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Father, I pray as we uh, consider your word this morning that you would give us David's heart for the scripture. Father, that we would have such a passion and such a love for your word uh, that we wouldn't be idolaters of the Bible, but we would find that the Bible is a revelation of Christ and of your purposes. And by virtue of that, it's your communication to us. It's your dialogue with us. It's your, your expression of your very heart and nature and person and your goals and values and the direction you want us to go. It tells us everything about living the Christian life. And Father, I'm asking that you would bless uh, our time this morning as we consider the, the magnificence of this document that we have in our hand. And I pray, God, that we wouldn't just honor it, but we would become students of it. We would know it. We would hide it in our heart, and it would transform our lives. And so, Father, go before us. Holy Spirit, lead me and let my lips bring glory and honor to the Son and to the Father. And we want to thank you, Holy Spirit, for your very personal and direct involvement in the inspiration of this word that we hold in our hand. And so, God, we want to say thank you and uh, ask that in every way that you would be honored and glorified by what takes place here today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Well, this book that we hold in our hand has been called the Book of Books, the greatest book ever written. And uh, it's been called the Book of Books because it uh, surpasses any other book that we have in, in, in human literature. And it's also called the Book of Books because it's made up of 66 books in one singular book. It's not the account of human efforts to find God, but rather the account of God, his effort to reveal himself to humanity. 
It's God's own record of his dealing with his people in the unfolding revelation of himself to the human race. In the Bible is revealed the will of God, the creator of all humanity, and it's given to his creatures by the creator for instruction and guidance along the path of life. And wow, we need instruction. When I think about Psalm 19 and the things that it says here, the wisdom, the insight, the encouragement, the strength that the Bible gives, those are things we definitely need. And that's what the Bible offers. The central focus of the story that God presents is a story of redemption of mankind through the sacrifice of his one and only son to those who would believe on him and accept him as their Savior and Lord. So it was written that people might believe, understand, know, love, and follow Jesus Christ. And our acceptance or rejection of this message is the determining factor for either our eternal uh, salvation or our eternal ruin, heaven or hell. You know, uh, over the years, a lot of very great people have commented on the value of the Bible. We hear fewer people commenting about that now in our culture, but historically, some of the greatest minds and leaders that we've ever had have said uh, amazing things about the Bible. Listen to some that are a part of our con uh, country and culture. Charles Dickens has said this, The New Testament is the very best book that was ever written or ever will be known in the world. This is Abraham Lincoln's statement about the Bible. I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through this book. Theodore Roosevelt, of course, another president of the United States, said, A thorough knowledge of the Bible is worth more than a college education. And George Mueller, one of the great saints of the faith, has said this about the Bible. He says, Our vigor, or the vigor of our spiritual life, will be in exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in, the life, in, in our life and thoughts. I solemnly state this from the experience of 54 years. I have read the Bible through 100 times and always with increasing delight. Each time it seems like a new book to me. Great has been the blessing from consecutive, diligent, daily study. I look upon it as a lost day when I have not had a good time over the Word of God. The, the quotes and the lists of quotes that go on and on and on about the importance of the Bible, not only for our personal lives, but for our culture, for our nation. Uh, they are, uh, there are a multitude of them. And all of these leaders point to the transforming impact that the Bible has. And so today I want to talk to you about uh, three aspects of the Bible. First of all, the uniqueness, uh, the structure, and the benefits of the Bible. And so if you're following along in your notes, you can... Um, you can uh, fill in the, the blanks and participate in that way. And I want to encourage you to really open your heart because this is a lot of information I'm sharing with you. Hopefully it's going to be very helpful and, and encouraging to you. But especially when we get to the benefits, I'm praying that God's really going to give you a hunger for the Word of God, that your hunger, whatever it is now, will elevate, be increased for a regular intake of the Word of God. So let's talk about the uniqueness of the Bible. Uh, by the way, unique means different and uh, distinctive with no equal. And the Bible is definitely unique, and it's got several aspects of uniqueness. And the first that I want to talk about is its unity. Uh, it's amazing that we've got a document, uh, despite so many factors that would, under normal circumstances, lead to a lot of diversity, a lot of disagreement, and disharmony. But God has used uh, the Bible and has authored the Bible himself, and by virtue of that, it has absolute uniqueness in its unity. It's been written, it was written over a 1,600-year period. That's a long time. And it began in 1500 B.C. to 100 A.D., uh, after uh, the death of Christ and resurrection. It was written by more than 40 authors. I mean, the list of authors is amazing in their diversity, every walk of life. We've got Moses, who was a political leader and a judge. He was trained in the University of Egypt. We have Joshua, who was a military general. We have David, who was a king, a poet, a musician, a shepherd, and a warrior. We have Solomon, who was a philosopher and a king. Nehemiah, a cupbearer to a pagan king. Amos, a herdsman. Daniel, a prime minister. Matthew, a tax collector. Mark, Peter's secretary. Luke, a physician and historian. Peter, a fisherman, and Paul, a rabbi. I mean, this collection is just, uh, the, the diversity, I don't think you could match in any kind of literature ever across the board, much less all in one self-contained volume. It was written in, in different places, from the wilderness to the dungeon, 
from the palace to the Isle of Patmos. It was written at different times, at war and peace. It was also written during authors' different moods. Some were just desperate in despair, and others are jubilant in their devotion and exalting of Christ and the events that were taking place. It was also uh, written on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. It was written in three different languages. Uh, in Hebrew, the primary language of the Old Testament. In Aramaic, uh, which covers uh, some aspects of the Old and New Testament. And Greek, which was the language of the time of Jesus' day. It was the universal language at that time. So those, those are the three languages that it was covering. It was also written concerning very, very, very controversial issues. It's still controversial. The topics and the the subject matter that it addresses, it doesn't, it doesn't move away from dealing with the really difficult issues of life. And, and usually when you have people writing, that many people over a 1,600-year period on three continents and three languages, there's going to be a lot of disagreement about moral issues and ethical issues and spiritual issues. And yet we have absolute unity in its teaching. The Bible is also unique in its teaching in a number of areas, and one of those is prophecy. Um, the Bible prophecy uh, has foretold many events hundreds of years in advance of their occurrence. And history has proven the Bible to be 100% accurate with its prophetic statements. It's also unique because it's honest. Um, any document that we have in hi historical literature, especially when it's dealing with, with history, is almost always modified uh, to make the person, whoever's the writer, look better or make their kingdom look better. But the Bible is ab absolutely uh, uh, clear. Uh, it's an unvarnished presentation of people's lives and the decisions that people made, good or bad. It's also uh, unique in its radical values, things that people had just never heard before. Like if you want to live, you have to die. If you want to lead, you have to serve. These are, these are upside-down values for the normal human thinking, but they're natural to the Bible because the Bible teaches us that God's ways are, are, are very different than our ways. It's also unique in its revelation of God. It's the only place and the only document where God says, I am opening my heart to you. I am opening and revealing my life to you. Everything about me, God says, I'm sharing with you at least what you need to know in order to have a relationship with me, what you need to know in order to walk with me, what you need to know in terms of being prepared not only for serving in this life, but also in the life to come. And God has revealed those things to us. You know, one of the things that, uh, that's probably the greatest gift that a person can give another person is the gift of their open communication, the gift of their heart, the expression of, of who they are, what they believe, what's important, what they value. And this is exactly what God has done for us in the revelation of himself through the word of God. The Bible is also unique in its circulation. It's been read by more people than any other book on the planet. It's been translated into more languages than any other book. There's some 2,200 languages in the world. Uh, um, I'm sorry, 6,500 languages in the world, and about 2,700 or so uh, of those languages now have a translation of the Bible in their own language. Uh, it does remain the number one bestseller of all time every single month, though you'll never see it on the New York Best Time Seller list. They don't like it. Uh, they wouldn't want to publish that the Bible is just so monotonous, you know. Bible, number one, Bible, number one, Bible, number one. And so they just agreed, well, let's just skip the Bible. We're going to take it out because it's just like it's, it's killing our fun. There's no rotation here. So they knocked the Bible out, but not out of its true place as being the number one read document and purchase document in the world. The Bible is also unique in its survival. Through efforts to eradicate it, uh, there have been numerous kings and, and dictators and even nations that have done their best to destroy it, to burn it, uh, to, uh, to outlaw it. And yet here we are. Uh, the Bible has got a more prolific publishing uh, venue and process across the globe than we've ever had. And uh, it's also unique in its survival as, as it relates to people trying to marginalize it. People, all kinds of people, very smart people, have tried to come against the Bible and to intellectually dismantle its veracity, its truthfulness, and its importance to our culture and to our lives. And some of those scholars, a number of them, you might recognize their names. One of them was C.S. Lewis. That's how he came to Christ, as he was trying to dismantle the Bible. But as he began to study the Bible, <clears throat> as he tested the Bible against not only logic, but 
tested it against itself and, and measured against history and science and everything else, C.S. Lewis became one of the most prolific apologists, and that's not somebody saying, I'm sorry, but that's someone making a defense for the Bible that the world has ever known. Another one of those men is James Montgomery. Another is Josh McDowell. All of these men, in, in particular Josh McDowell, he was doing his thesis statement uh, for his doctoral program, and his, his objective was, was to prove and disprove the Bible. And so he came with an agenda to disprove the Bible and became a believer of Jesus Christ and became one of the most important 20th century apologists that the, that the church has ever had. And we have many, many books by, uh, uh, by Josh McDowell that, that outline and explain the confidence that we can have in this book, this text of the Bible that we carry with us and have in our hand. And of course, the Bible is unique in its influence. Uh, those of us that are, are Christians, I'm assuming that's most of us here, we've received Christ, we've believed on Him, we've believed His Word, and then our lives are completely changed. They're transformed. They're just not the same. I was listening to a testimony of a friend this last week, and, and I was blown away because I knew this person. I've known him for a while, but I'd never heard their full testimony. And as I heard them share their testimony, I was just like, Man, that's amazing, you know? But that's like every story that every Christian has is amazing at how God can change and transform the heart of a human being simply by words written on a page. But these aren't simply words. This is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. There's something unique and powerful and potent about this book that we hold in our hands, and it's been life-changing. Well, the structure of the Bible is quite interesting, and I hope this is actually going to help you because some of you might be a bit confused about how the Bible is structured and how it's put together, and I don't know if you've ever noticed that it's not chronological. If you just kind of read through it, and you're reading, and you're reading stuff twice, and it's like, why are they saying this again in a different book? And so I'm going to share some things that I, th I think might be helpful to you. First of all, as far as the structure goes, it's made up of 66 books. Most people know uh, that, that, that that's the case. It's divided into two parts. You have the Old Testament and you've got the New Testament. Does anybody know how many books are in the Old Testament besides Bible college students? Anybody know? 39. Okay, I heard somebody say 39. There are 39 uh, books that make up the Old Testament. One of the things that, I, uh, that I've used as kind of a memory device on that is... Uh, Old Testament. Old is three letters. Testament is nine letters. So Old Testament, 39 books. Anybody know how many New Testament books they are? 27. And a little reminder, a way to remember that is three times nine, 27. So 39 Old Testament books, 27 New Testament books, three times, times nine. Now, the, this whole concept of testament is a covenant. That's what this word actually means in the Greek. Uh, so when you've got an Old Testament and a New Testament, what we have is an Old Covenant, the basis upon which a man, is, a man or woman is made right with God, and the basis of the New Testament. Uh, they're both by faith, by the way, but the expressions of how that comes about is a little bit different. The Old Testament covenant, covenant was a conditional covenant. Um, in that time frame, it was called a suzerain treaty. So it was a, a covenant of agreement with a king and a, and a vassal, somebody that was lesser in position. And the king would say, I would do, I'll do these things for me if you do these things in return. So if you follow me, if you obey, if you, if you can, uh, conform, then I will favor you and bless you. That's a suzerain treaty. That's the Old Testament. The New Testament has a different type of covenant. It's called an unconditional covenant. And it's God telling man the story of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, and of a future hope of glory for all who believe, and it's based on faith alone. Now, it was based on faith in the Old Testament, but the Old Testament was written to prepare our hearts to receive Christ, to receive salvation that wasn't based on condition, but it was based on a complete work that was done on the cross. And so, no longer are we trying to follow the Ten Commandments and, you know, keeping all 613 of those commands, but we're simply believing on Christ and by virtue of that, the Bible says that we've been born again, we're clothed with the righteousness of Christ, we've been made sons and daughters of the King, we are now the bride of Christ, and the King is preparing a place for us, and soon to come for the church. And so we have this exalted place, and it's not based on our performance, but now, rather than trying to do the, the works of the Old Testament to win God's favor, we now do those works 
uh, of the New Testament, which is loving God and loving others with all of our heart, which the Bible says in Jesus' own words, takes care of the entire Old Testament law. We simply love God and love one another. That by itself is all that we're required to do. And it's the result not of our effort in our flesh to win God's favor, but it's the result of our thanks and appreciation for what God has done. It moves us to want to respond to God by living this new life. And so the motivation is completely different. And uh, this is just a beautiful aspect of the difference between the Old and New Testament. The Old Testament was an account of a nation, a particular nation, the nation of Israel. It begins with the account of creation, tells us the story of the Jewish people uh, all the way to the time of Christ. As we said, it's made up of of 39 books written by 28 different authors over a span of almost 2,000 years. The nation of Israel was founded and uh, was nurtured by God to prepare the way for Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, who would save us from our sins and establish God's kingdom. And his appearance of Jesus on earth uh, is a central event of all human history. The Old Testament sets the stage for it, and the New Testament describes it. The Old Testament foreshadows Christ, and the New Testament presents him in all his fullness. So what is the, what's the, New Testament, the Old Testament? How is it kind of laid out? Well, it's laid out by the type of literature, which is this is where us kind of stumbles us as, as North Americans with the kind of a Greek philosophy and Greek thinking, because Greek thinking is more systematic and, and more sequential, whereas um, uh, Hebrew thinking was more thematic. And so when the, the authors put the Bible together, they didn't put it together completely chronologically but they actually organized it according to a a word that's called genre in literature. It means a type of literature. And so we've got three types of literature in the Old Testament. We've got historical literature, poetical literature, and then we've got prophetical literature. And so it's actually mapped out that way in your Bible. And that's why we have the first 17 books of the, the Bible. They're called historical books. Why historical? Because they tell us of the history of God's work on earth. And in particular, the creation story, but the calling out of Abraham, and then the the establishment of the nation of Israel, and all of the adventures and misadventures of this people that were called by God. The books of these these 17 historical books uh, trace this development, their disobedience, their downfall, their calling, uh, their deliverance, and, uh, and, and finally, the preparation for us and for the uh, early church for the work of Christ so that we would recognize him when he came. And then we've got five poetical books. And of course, those books are, um, are Psalms, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes. These are referred to as the wisdom literature. And uh, we all love the Psalms. We all love the Proverbs. I don't know if you've spent much time in, in uh, Song of Solomon, but that's an amazing book. But actually, one of my favorite books that's kind of unsung is Ecclesiastes, uh, because it's a, it's a story of Solomon's struggle in the time frame when he forsook the Lord. He was the wisest guy on the planet, and yet in all his wisdom, he does sometimes what we do, which is kind of walk away. And, uh, and then he describes life apart from Christ as he walks away, and, and, and the futility of his living and futility of everything he was doing. It's like nothing matters anymore. It just doesn't seem to count. Does anything even, even really, is there even reality? And, and Ecclesiastes addresses that. Finally, he comes to his senses at the, book of the, at the end and says, hey, the only thing worth following is God. That's the only thing that makes sense in the world. And maybe today you're struggling a little bit with, with making sense of things. And I want to tell you, uh, you'd be wise uh, to avoid the, the time frame, maybe 40 years or so of Solomon's misadventure of walking away from the Lord and avoid that and get right to the end of the story, which is the only thing that really matters is following the Lord. And then we have 17 prophetical books. So we've got 17 and then 5 and then 17. That's the pattern in the Old Testament as far as literature goes. And we've got those 17 prophetical books, uh, which calls God's people to righteous living. I mean, all these prophets, what is their message? Repent. Repent. Why? Because the people of Israel, even though they were God's chosen people, had this uh, persistent pattern of idolatry. They had a persistent pattern of, of immorality. Those are the two primary things that people seem to struggle with is idolatry and immorality. And so God, through the prophets, keeps speaking to the people this word of repentance. And to be honest with you, I think that word is still appropriate for us today. I think there's a great need, especially in the church, 
especially because we're ambassadors for Christ, especially because God has called us to be uh, the manifold wisdom uh, to the heavenly realm that's watching, especially because of these things, the Bible tells us that we need to be a people that are set apart completely for God. And nothing held back. We're not, we're not uh, adulterous in our, in our relationship with God, that we're not looking for other things to replace God. We're not putting God on the back burner, but we're actually living our life fully for God. That was the call of every prophet who ever spoke in God's name. And these prophets are divided into two groups. One is the major prophets and one is the minor prophets. And uh, it's kind of embarrassing theologically to explain this because it's so uh, evident, I guess, uh, but the major prophets are just the, called major, not because their works are more important, but because their works are longer. So the guys that were long-winded are called the major prophets, and the guys that were short-winded are called the minor prophets. And maybe in some spec, uh, aspects, being a minor prophet is a good thing. But these, um, uh, these writers of the major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Daniel, and Ezekiel. Those five make up the major prophets, and the other 12 are the minor prophets, Hosea uh, through Malachi, and they're shorter books, and that's the only reason that they're um, called the minor prophets. And then between the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have a time frame of 400 years that passed with God being silent, and he wasn't speaking. He wasn't speaking through prophets or priests or anybody. There was just silence, and the people were, were broken over that. They knew that something was wrong, but what God was doing is he was creating this intense hunger for a voice and that voice ended up coming from the wilderness in the person of John the Baptist. And uh, that silence was broken by the last of the Old Testament prophets who ended up being the one to introduce Jesus Christ. And so we have 27 books in the New Testament written by nine different authors over a period of somewhere between 90 to 100 years. And again, like the Old Testament, these, uh, these books, these 27 books, are broken up according to their genre, their type of literature. And so the first five books of the Bible are historical. Anybody know what the first four books are? Exactly. I couldn't hear anything you said. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They, they represent the historical books, and they're telling a narrative. And they're explaining historically what happened when Jesus came. And they tell the story beginning with John the Baptist and the conception of John and the conception of Jesus and the miraculous uh, uh, intervention of God in human history to bring a deliverer. And it tells a story of the beginning of Jesus' ministry and the, the heart that he had and his passion for reaching people and, and reaching the lost and calling back the lost people of Israel and revealing that God has a heart for Gentiles too. And it was always his plan to save all of mankind Anyone that would receive and believe tells a story of his death and resurrection. You know, I, I, I was thinking about that this week, and I thought, what, what could be a greater injustice on the planet than Jesus dying on the cross? Is, there, is it possible there's an injustice that's more dramatic or more grievous than the perfect man, the God-man, without sin, with only love and concern and care, and yet speaking the truth? Is there, is there anything that we can even think of that's more unjust than his crucifixion on the cross? It's part of what was so completely devastating to the disciples, not to mention that their, their king, their savior, was now in a grave. But praise God, he was raised from the dead on the third day and is now seated at the right hand of God. And we are in him, found in him, seated at the right hand of God in Christ because of his finished work. But these four gospels outline and delineate this amazing story of God's intervention, something that no one, you know, he prophesied. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. The signs were there. The signals were there. Uh, the words were there. But it was too much for the Jewish mind, or any mind for that matter, to wrap itself around the possibility of God actually taking on human flesh, becoming a man, humbling himself, and going to the cross for the sins of mankind. That's just beyond the scope of anyone's imagination. And so when it happened, the drama was intense. It was amazing. To this day, it's still an amazing event that took place. But these four Gospels are different. Some people ask, well, why do we have the same story written four times? Well, we have it written four times because it's written to different audiences, first of all, but it's actually written with a different perspective and a different goal. 
And so the book of Matthew was written to express and to, to, to reveal Jesus Christ as a king to the Jews. Mark was revealing Jesus Christ as a servant, which was a foreign concept, that God would be a servant to man. Luke revealed him as the son of man, which is an Old Testament phrase that reveals and, and looks to, according to the book of Daniel, this Messiah that was promised. And then John, uh, Jesus being the son of God, that there was this intimate relationship and in revealing Jesus Christ as not just a, a prophet or a good teacher, but is actually the person that he is and described in the Old and New Testament is that Jesus Christ is indeed God in the human flesh. And then, of course, the final book of the historical narratives is the book of Acts, which takes us from the death and resurrection of Christ to the day of Pentecost, and then all the way through for the first, um, you know, probably about 50 years, 60 years of the birth of the church, and takes us to uh, the time of Paul. And it was, it's, an, it's an amazing story uh, that really reveals in a very condensed fashion about 40 to 50 years of the New Testament church. I, I remember as reading a as a young believer reading the New Testament and reading the book of Acts, and I was just like, man, it's just like every moment of every day was packed with healings and miraculous things, and it was just like nonstop until I realized as I did some research that it was a 40-year span that this was covering. So uh, it doesn't mean that a lot of miraculous things weren't taking place all the time. They were, but these were events that were actually selected out of all the things that were happening in the New Testament time that are describing the power of God, not only at that time, but the power of God that we still have access to today if we're willing to let God empower us, lead us, fill us, and use us for his glory. So those are the first five historical books. And then we've got 21 uh, epistles. Can, does anybody know what the word epistle means? It's a strange term. Anybody know what it means? Letter. Yeah, it's a... You know, sometimes I'm like, why do they, why do they make it difficult? Uh, but it's an epistle because that's the Greek term for these letters. And so Paul wrote epistles and, you know, James wrote epistles and John wrote epistles. But in essence, it's just like us writing an email or a long blog is probably a better way to put it, uh, to one another or to friends. And in some cases, what we have is we actually have letters. In some cases, it's blogs. Some of these letters went directly to known recipients and some of them kind of went to the churches in general uh, across the board in, in Asia Minor at the time. And so we have Paul, the apostle. He wrote 13 of these epistles. John wrote three. Peter wrote two. James wrote one. Jude wrote one. And then, of course, the book of Hebrews that we're not certain who wrote. It might have been Paul. might have been Barnabas. might have been another author. So we're not exactly certain on that. Uh, and then we've got one prophetical book, verses of 17 of the Old Testament. Anybody know what the prophetical book is? Revelation. And uh, that word, by the way, revelation is apocalypsis in the Greek, and it means the unveiling. And, and the reason it was called the unveiling is because the, uh, the, the Jews only had an understanding that led them through the chronology of prophecy through the millennial kingdom, but they didn't have anything after that. So the idea of a new heaven and a new earth and all of that was, was foreign to the Jew, uh, to the, 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 the theology of the Jew. And so the apocalypse was God's unveiling of these additional elements of what's coming for us as believers, both Old Testament, New Testament believers. And it's quite amazing. In fact, it's the one book that promises a blessing, if you read it, uh, is the book of Revelation. So some things that are interesting about the Bible, and you've got these things in your notes, so I'll go over these very quickly. Uh, but I find these very interesting. First of all, the word biblos uh, is the origin of the term Bible. We don't have the word Bible anywhere in the Bible except on the cover, and it says Holy Bible. Uh, but nobody really knows what the word Bible is. Most people don't, except it comes from the papyrus plant, which is called the Biblos. And, uh, and so through the machination of, of French and Latin and then finally coming to us in English, we have the plural of Biblos, which is Biblia. And because it was made up of various parchments that were coming from this papyrus plant, that made up the book, it was in the plural, Biblia, which is where we get our English word, Bible, from. So now you can, uh, you can impress your friends uh, that don't know the, the origin of the Bible. It's also organized by genre instead of chronology, which we've already talked about. So both Old and New Testament, there are some aspects of chronology, but only in the historical narratives. All the rest of it is, is organized 
based on the type of literature it is. So one of the things that I, um, I've been doing for many years uh, that I really enjoy in Bible reading is that I read the Bible chronologically. And there are Bibles that are actually <clears throat> laid out that way. So you don't, you don't have to use any kind of a, of a format where you say, okay, now I need to read these pa passages next. Uh, the Bible itself is actually formatted that way. So when you read it, you're reading from cover to cover chronologically. Um, but there are, uh, I think there's a, a little pamphlet called, uh, what is it called, Becky? Chronological Bible. Um, reading through the Bible chronologically, I think that's the name of it. And it's by Kohlenberger. And I've been using that for probably 20 years. And I get, I'm so edified by that because it tells me how to read the Bible chronologically, where they all fit in. Where, in other words, like when you read the Psalms, those aren't happening in a vacuum. That's happening based on, on 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Chronicles. So those events have parallel, and you can read and read the Psalms and say, wow, David was going through that, and this is a Psalm he wrote. And it gives you an, a window into the heart of David. And there are many other types of, of uh, parts of the literature like that that are so enlightening as you begin to read the Bible chronologically. So I, I have a pattern for 20 years of reading the Bible at least once a year, usually twice a year, chronologically, and I find that very, very helpful uh, to read it that way. Paul's letters are organized according to the length. Again, it's longest to shortest, like the major letters, the minor letters. So his 13 letters all come at the beginning, and if you notice, it begins with Romans, which is a longer book, and then it ends with the shorter books. The chapter divisions, the Bible didn't come with chapter divisions. Have you ever noticed like when Jesus was... Um, uh, in the temple and he was reading from the book of Isaiah, uh, he didn't quote chapter and verse. When Paul was talking uh, with various uh, leaders, spiritual leaders, he'd, he'd say somewhere in the Bible it says, and it wasn't because he was a moron or because he didn't memorize chapter and verse, there weren't any chapters and verses. They just had the entire text of that t entire section of Scripture. And so Isaiah, which is a very long book, he would just say somewhere in Isaiah it says this, and the people would recognize it, but it wasn't until Cardinal Hugo in 1250 uh, A.D. developed the chapter headings that we were able to uh, tell people what chapter to go to. And the purpose was is so that people could actually read the Bible together in a, in a setting like a church. And so that helped a lot. But then you had a problem as well because now we got the chapter. What part of the chapter do you want to go to? And uh, Sir Robert Stevens in 1551 developed New Testament divisions by verse and then in 1560, in the Geneva Bible, which is one of the greatest uh, works of printing ever accomplished in human history, uh, chapter and verse divisions were introduced both to the Old and New Testament. And it really just, it just had an enormous influence on helping people to grow in their understanding of the Word of God. What's the longest chapter in the Bible? Well, you have it in your notes, Psalm 119. You know, I used to hate that chapter. Any, is there anybody else that's willing to confess that? And you're, if you've read through the Bible, you get to Psalm 119, it's like, oh man, it's the mammoth psalm. I'm going to be here for days, you know. It goes on and on and on. Well, it's become one of my favorite psalms because it declares the praises of God. And if you know a little bit about the, the way that that psalm is formed, it's amazing. It's a work of art and mathematics. It actually begins with the, each letter, that section begins with each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 letters, and each of those sections begins with one of those letters. And every line, though you won't notice it in the English, every line in the Hebrew begins with that letter. And so it's really a work of art declaring the magnificence of this particular book that we hold in our hand. The shortest book of uh, chapter in the Bible is 2 John. The shortest verse is John 11:35, uh, And I remember that well because when we um, occasionally, which wasn't very often, but when we had any kind of family devotion around the table, we had this little, uh, little tray of cards. Some of you that are older will remember this, the bread of life. Anybody remember the, the bread of life? And it was just this little thing with the plastic cover on it, and it had these little scriptures on it. And uh, so you'd read these scriptures, and I didn't really like doing this at all as a young kid. It, it just seemed kind of meaningless to me. I wasn't interested I found it to be uh, burdensome. That's just my heart. That's where I was. And so I had discovered where John 11.35 was and what color it was because there's color. There's blue and yellow and pink and all these different colors. You guys remember, some of you. So it's all color-coded. And that particular card, I had kind of just ever so slightly bent the edge. And so I knew which one it was. And I just I found delight in being able to say Jesus wept, you know, because it was the shortest verse. Some of those verses were longer, and I would just nail on that one. But, you know, when you think about Jesus weeping, 
Uh, and you see the heart of Christ for the world. I mean, that's, like, I, I'm glad Jesus wept. I, I'm glad that, that it breaks his heart because there's a part of me that I'm kind of broken about what's happening in our culture and in our world right now. And, and there's a grieving process in us, and it, it, it comforts me to know that that grieves the Lord too. And it comforts me to know that he's going to take care of it. That even though things are a bit out of kilter and maybe more than a bit out of kilter right now in not only our country but in our world, it, it grieves the heart of God. And the wonderful news for us as believers is that God has got a plan. And so God grieves over our personal suffering. God grieves over injustice. God grieves over the, the immorality and the lack of ethics of our country and our culture and our, even our neighborhoods and sometimes our own lives. God grieves over these things and we grieve over them and God has a solution. And so I, I want to encourage you that those of you that may be grieving today is that these things that grieve us, if they're based on sin and the corruption of the world, they grieve the heart of God. But God doesn't simply, you know, sit up in heaven and, and weep and, and wonder what's going to happen. God is forcefully advancing his kingdom. You may not see it right now. You may not see how your deliverance will come, but your deliverance will come because God is a God of justice. He's a God of love, but he's also a God of justice, and that's very comforting. And then, of course, the center verse of the entire Bible is Psalm 118, verse 8. You might even want to turn there for just a minute. But this is what it says. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. That's the very centerpiece verse. If you look in the Hebrew and the Greek, not in the English, but in the Hebrew and the Greek manuscripts, and you get the very center verse, it's Psalm 118, verse 8. And the very center word of that verse is Yahweh, the Lord. And so we find that at the very center of the Bible is God's name himself. I want to finish by, um, by detailing several benefits of reading the Bible. There's certainly more than this, but these are the ones that God brought to mind as I prepared. The first is salvation and eternal life. John 20, verse 31 says this, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the entire agenda that God has for this Bible, is that he, he, these things are written so that you might know his word and that you might believe in his word, and by believing that you might have eternal, everlasting life. The Bible also tells us that, uh, that we gain wisdom and knowledge by the word of God. I can't even begin to tell you how many principles in our culture, at least in the founding of our country, and how many principles of so many arenas of life, business and law and governance and economics and all kinds of areas, are based on the wisdom of Scripture. And I can't even begin to tell you how many sins are avoidable. They're all avoidable. The, the pain that we put ourselves through, the dilemma, the, the heartache, the suffering so often self-inflicted, could be avoided by simply applying the wisdom of God's Word and saying, you know, it's good enough for these guys. I don't need to go there. I don't need to find out myself. I'll take God's Word at face value, and these certain things I'll avoid. And these other things that he says to, to pursue, I will pursue. And, and, of course, the blessings that are accompanied by that are remarkable. And so God gives us the opportunity, that's what part of what Psalms and Proverbs in particular talks about, is the wisdom that God makes available for us if we'll simply open the book and make it a regular part of our experience. And then we get guidance. Psalm 119, 105 talks about this. Psalm 133, 2 Peter 119. But Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. And... Um, there's a part of this verse I love and there's a part of this verse I don't like. The part that I love is that God has a plan and God wants to guide me. The part that I don't like is it's a lamp and it only is for my feet. <laughs> I want a floodlight. I want like a, you know, a big halogen LED, something that goes out for years into the future so I can know where I'm going. And God says, no, I'm not going to give that to you because you would then stop depending on me. And, and you know, the sad thing is, but the reality that God understands about our fallen human flesh is that need and, and confusion and uncertainty drive us to our king. Those things bring us to a place of openness to, to his voice like nothing else. In fact, uh, C.S. Lewis has said that, that our pain is the shouting of God. 
It's the, it's the thing that really gets through to us more than anything else and causes us to cry out for him, for his leadership, for his guidance, for his wisdom. And so his, his word is a lamp. It, it shines out just far enough. It shines just far enough for the next few steps, but not so far that we'll, we'll leave the lamp behind, not so far that we will become self-reliant. But he wants to give you guidance, and some of you need guidance today. You're faced with decisions. You don't know what to do. James says if anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God. God is, is willing to give wisdom, and he's willing to give guidance for those that just ask. Joshua 1.8 and Proverbs or Psalm 1 tell us that success and prosperity come through the reading of the Bible. This is phenomenal. Let me, let me read Psalm 1 to you. It says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. And listen to this. Whatever he does prospers. Whatever he does prospers. In Joshua 1.8, it says a little differently. It says that, that this person will have success in whatever he does, that there will be a, a confidence, a power, a strength in the person that actually follows the Word of God, that God will grant that person favor and blessing by virtue of being a person that meditates on this book day and night. It doesn't mean that you have to have it open all the time, but that, in my mind and understanding, means that I'm taking with me my quiet time from the morning, I'm thinking about it during the day, I might be memorizing that verse, but I'm letting it kind of be a part of my day. And as I, as I apply it to my life, and as I share it with other people, I'm meditating on it, I'm thinking about it, I'm considering its application. And by virtue of that, God says that he will prosper you and give you success. I don't know anybody else, any other piece of literature in the world that says, if you follow this, there's a, a divine blessing promised that you'll be favored and you'll have success in whatever you put your hand to. But that's what's promised to a man or woman who is well acquainted with the Word of God. And, uh, you know, I, there's something in us. I don't know what it is, but we want to we find our own way to succeed. We, we, we work and we strive and we, we plan and we strategize. And so often our things come to naught. You know, we struggle. We can't figure out why God isn't blessing our plan. Frequently, we're not even on God's page. And we haven't been led by God because we're not really seeking Him first. And we don't have His kingdom on our mind. And the result is, is that we've got stuff on our mind. And we want Him to kind of be in our back pocket to make good on what we're trying to do. But God really isn't interested in our plan. He's interested in His plan. And he wants us on his page doing his will, being guided by him. And as we're doing his will, he promises that he's going to bless and prosper whatever we put our hand to as it relates to the furtherance of his kingdom. And by the way, that furtherance of his kingdom is the only place you'll ever find absolute satisfaction and contentment because it's what we were designed for. The Bible also gives us encouragement and in hope. In Proverbs 15, 4, it says, Paul speaking, for everything that was written in the past, he's talking about the Bible, Old and New Testament, was, uh, was written to teach us and that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. I can't tell you how many times I go to the Bible for hope. <laughs> I'm there every day. I I'm going for encouragement. I'm going for guidance. I'm going to have my mind renewed. I'm going to be reminded of God's perspective and the eternal nature of his kingdom, the fact that he's just, the fact that he's going to get this all straightened out, the fact that I don't need to be the person to do that. God will do it. My job is to entrust myself to him and keep doing good. That's the calling of myself and for us as believers. That's our calling. But all the rest of this, this encouragement that comes from all the examples of the saints that have marched on before us is extremely edifying and helpful. And it changes the course not of necessarily our circumstances at the moment, but it changes our thinking about those circumstances. And I don't know about you, but I found that my thinking is almost always the problem. How I think and how I view circumstances that are difficult sometimes can get me thinking the wrong direction. And the Bible is the remedy for that, and it gives us encouragement. It also protects us from sin. Psalm 119 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so when you actually hide the Word of God in your heart and you know it, 
and, and you're not just, you know, occasionally coming and, and hearing it. You know, the average Christian only reads the Bible or hears about the Bible on Sunday morning for the hour message that's, that's taught or less. But God tells us that uh, He wants to protect us, and that protection comes from knowing how to put on the armor of God and what our armor is. And so if you need protection, if you need uh, power to overcome, this is the place to come. Do you need encouragement? This is the place to come. The Bible has it there for you. It's also a place where we gain a knowledge of God. This is the place where we go to understand who He is, to know His character. It's very difficult to trust someone you don't know very well, but it gets easier to trust someone that you have confidence in, someone that you see their character and you see consistency and you see a, a, a pattern of their quality of life, the longer you see that and the more evident it is, the easier it is to trust that person. And the Bible is filled with the description of God's faithfulness, His consistency, His character, His person, His nature. And so it gives us a knowledge of God. And that it also gives us a knowledge of the future, which is remarkable. The Bible tells us that God never does anything without revealing it to the prophets. That God has actually opened the minds and hearts of us as believers to see and understand things and to, and to understand even what's happening in our culture, what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening in the United States, what's happening globally, and what God's eternal plan is and His purpose. And that gives us hope and encouragement. It gives us a, a different way of thinking about life. It inspires us. It, it gets us away from thinking doom and gloom. It gets us away from worrying about what's going to happen, happen on the fiscal cliff, you know, come to December. It, it stops us from worrying about what's happening in the Middle East and and, and uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization now becoming a non-voting member uh, within that uh, organization, essentially the first step to legitimately recognizing them as a country. And then their next step is to be legitimized as having Jerusalem as their capital. So all these things that are happening all around us, none of these things make sense until you open this book. And God reveals not only His heart, not only does He reveal our mission, but He also reveals our future. And friends, we're, we're in those last days. I, I hope you see that. I hope you understand that. That's not a fearful thing. That's a, that's a privileged event. This is a privileged place for us to be in, and it calls for the church to respond to the message of God's Word, which is, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men which is, if anyone wants to come after me, he must follow me, take up his cross, and, and completely devote himself and give himself or herself to me. These are the things that God has called us to as a church. And your life matters. And God knows your struggles. He knows everything about you. That's clear in Scripture. And he cares. And he loves you. And he has compassion. And he's not forsaken you. And he's going to complete in you the work that he's begun. So this morning, we've, we've had a chance to kind of look at the outline of the Bible and an introduction to it. Uh, but my encouragement to you, kind of in closing, is that Jesus, when he was finished teaching on the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, he told a parable about uh, two, two men building houses, one building on sand and one building on the rock. And of course, the wind came and the storm blew and, and, and both houses were shaken. But only one stood and the other one fell. The one built on sand which is a, is a life that's not built on this truth, which is the point that Jesus was making. If your life isn't built on this truth, when, when troubling times come, your foundation is going to be weak and you'll fall apart. But if your foundation is on this book, you'll face and struggle with many of the same things that unbelievers face. But you have a different foundation, and by virtue of that, your house will stand. And it's based on the person who knows, believes, and actually applies this book. So God maps it out for us. He tells us, you want to succeed? You want to prosper? Do you want to, you want to have a new life? Do you want to be restored and, and be reinvigorated in your personal walk with God? Do you want to know the future? Do you want to know God's plan for your life? Do you want guidance and all these things that He promises? Then be a person of the Bible. Be a person that, that saturates yourself with this book. Be a person that's in this book daily and learning how to have a quiet time. And in the weeks to come, we're going to make an offer. Uh, most of you have already been trained how to have quiet times. But for those of you that have never been trained how to use the 959 devotional uh, series that we, uh, that we use, we want to teach that to you so that you can have a very practical, successful way of reading the Bible on a daily basis. It's life-changing. This book, 
This ink on paper is powerful. And any man or woman that makes it their goal to expose themselves to this book and to read this book and to give themselves to an understanding of this book and the application of its principles, their life will never be the same. And you will be on a road, which most of you already are, but even more so on a clear path of the transformation of God that you might be the very people he's designed you to be, those that are like Christ. Father, we thank you for this, um, this time this morning. I thank you for your word. What a blessing, God, that you've given this to us, that you've inspired it, that you've placed it in our hands, that you've preserved it. And now we have the, the privilege and the joy to embrace it and to make it a regular part of our personal devotions, of regular time in the Word every day, and for those of us that have families or married, to make it a regular part of our communication with our spouse and our family, our children, our neighbors, our, our co-workers, that wherever we go, that we would be spreading the fragrant aroma of Christ through the Word of God. And so, Father, forgive us for taking for granted such a, a great gift, and I pray that we would embrace it. I pray that we would unwrap it on a daily basis. And we receive these divine encounters as they really are, not just a, a check mark for our, our, our day, but actually a divine encounter that you've prepared in advance before time began that we might be prepared and ready for this particular day that you've put in front of us and that we might live it to your praise and your glory. And so, Father, make us what we are already, your bride. Set our hearts aside for you and you alone, God. Forgive us for idolatry in any form it might take and for spiritual adultery and moving off to other things that we've given our love to. And I pray that we would return, God, to our first love and that in these days in which we're living, we might bring you glory and honor and praise, both now and forevermore. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to finish our service.